So let me um, start by start with our first uh, usual agenda item. Uh, just looking over conceptual questions, and I guess um, for this one, I must not have had um, text a lot of quest textable questions that I liked, <laughs> which is why you see these three questions that I've written, and I don't think uh, as looking through my um, the homework help page to see if I've done any of these questions, and I don't think I have. So, uh, so but I'll say something short about it. Um, I think this question is relatively simpler, and it, it is really an open-ended question, so that you can, um, so that I can see that you've paid some attention to the derivation of electric field of an infinite line of charge and the magnetic field of an infinite line of current. There are going to be some uh, similarities. I guess uh, one similarity you can, um, that, that would be kind of obvious, just, just staring at you at the, in the face, is that in both of these cases, the electric field due to a line of current, a line of charges, is proportional to 1 over r. And the same will be true for magnetic field due to a line of current, uh, yeah, line, infinite line of current, it will be proportional to 1 over r. That's, uh, um, I, I guess this is one of the things that you can point to and say, oh, the, the electric field was inverse square law, and with a, a charge distribution that's a infinite in one dimension, it works out to give you 1 over r dependence on distance. And because magnetic field it, law is also inverse square law, as I pointed out in covering Biot-Savart's law. When you have a similar geometry, you get a similar distance dependence. Now, there, there'll be a few uh, differences uh, that you can point out for contrast portion of it. You can look at the constant coefficients that are used uh, because electric fields and magnetic fields have different units. They should have uh, uh, they should have um, uh, different coefficients in front and the one that's really striking are the directions of electric field and magnetic fields electric fields go away radially away from the line uh, magnetic fields now uh, using one of the shortcut rules it, they kind of wrap around the line so the shortcut rule being if your thumb is pointing in the direction of current then your um, the direction your fingers curl in. So here, um, so thumb pointing towards you, the direction the fingers curl in, the counterclockwise direction, that's the tangential direction that the magnetic fields point in. So, but, so this is an open-ended question, just to uh, take some look at the uh, derivations you've seen and just point out a few things that are common, compare, and that are different contrast. Oh, and at least to the right-hand rule. Uh, let me show you where in the textbook it gives you those right-hand rules. I think if you, this is me giving you a hint that you can actually search for RHR. That will actually um, lead you to two of the right-hand rules. And um, the other one, you have to find it in context. So let me see if I can find it. Um, and I will tell you that... Um, so I hate arbitrarily numbered things. And um, earlier when I was in the lecture, when I was giving number of conductor properties, those were somewhat arbitrarily numbered. You don't have to remember their numbering system. Uh, Right-hand rule is a similar. The way they are numbered here, it's uh, arbitrary. So um, what you do have to know is how to use the right hand to figure out the direction of magnetic force and magnetic field. As long as you can do that, whether you have these specific rules memorized, doesn't matter. So this is what your textbook numbers as RHR1. So this is the whole hand version of right hand rule. Uh, hand in the direction of the first vector, uh, oriented so that you can curl it in the direction of the second vector, uh, be kind of coming towards you more or less. Then the direction of thumb gives you the, um, the, the product, the cross product of those two vectors. So I think, and this is the right-hand rule that you would have learned in physics 4A in the context of rotation and torque and all that good stuff that involves cross product. And uh, there's an R, RHR2, that's the second right-hand rule. I like to think of this as a shortcut rule because it's, um, 
So the RHR1 is the basic right-hand rule that describes the mathematical definition of cross product. And the other two rules that you will see, uh, they are shortcut rules in that you wouldn't use it in any generic context using involving cross product, but in situations involving currents and magnetic field, it gives you the directional magnetic field that would be consistent with what you get with applying the basic rule. So here, the basic rule and Peel's average law, cross product in Peel's average law. So here, this is the first shortcut rule, or RHR2. It tells you to uh, orient your right hand so that your thumb points in the direction of current. Then the direction in which your fingers curl in is the direction of the um, magnetic field. So it's showing uh, with the thumb pointing up, the magnetic field points so that uh, let's see, is that right? Oh wait, wait. <laughs> so that when your fingers are on the right side, left side of the current, if the fingers are pointing out, it towards you uh, out of the screen, and that's what you see in the text book. And um, on the other side, it's uh, pointing into the screen. So that's kind of the circular direction that's sketched out here. The third rule, I don't think your textbook numbers it as RHR3, but it's uh, something that will come up uh, when you are dealing with source of magnetic field. Oh, we are in the chapter. So uh, they might describe this either when you are talk looking at, um, either when you are looking at magnetic field due to a, a current loop or magnetic field due to a solenoid. Let me check the magnetic field due to current loop first. Um, so, bunch of math. <laughs> I also do a derivation. Um, so, I can use this context to describe it, but let me make sure I can find in the book. Um, let's see. Yeah, it might be in the context of solenoid because that's where it. Um, makes even more sense than in the context of the loop. So the solenoid, you see, if I give you a hint, others may be found as you read through the text to the book, okay? Um, I mean, I guess I can describe it. So um, let me just describe it. I think it is given in the textbooks. I'm not just uh, making it up. And, you know, even if I'm making it up, it, <laughs> what's important is uh, it's uh, consistent with the basic right-hand rule. So you can kind of see it in this picture. So it's a kind of, a, there's a bit of a symmetry in the comparison where when you had a straight current that resulted in circular kind of magnetic field. So here you have a circular kind of current and that circular kind of current will result in straight-ish magnetic field in a limited region within the circle. So this is what you see here. So let me, I think this is drawn um, with the current coming out of the screen at top and going into the screen at the bottom. So, so I'm just uh, taking my right hand and orienting in such a way that my fingers uh, curl in the direction of the current, the circular current. Then as I orient my hand that way, uh, so it's curling in the same direction as the current, the direction my thumb points in, that points in the, the right direction, to it, from your view, right work. Um, that's the direction that magnetic field due to this circular current po points in, in the center of the circle. So this is the second shortcut rule that allows you to figure out quickly what the direction of magnetic field is given a loop of current. So, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I thought your textbook does describe it somewhere. Uh, it's definitely described in lecture. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so, ah, magnetic fields are given in units of Tesla. It's a Tesla similar to Coulomb and Ampere. It's a quite large unit. Uh, it's kind of like large like a coulomb. One coulomb of charge is a fairly large amount of charge. It's uh, almost uh, unrealistic to have in static electricity situation. And one tesla of magnetic field is fairly large amount of magnetic field. It takes a fair amount of effort to get a one tesla field. Um, so let's see, in this unit, give a few values of magnetic fields. Um, 
I thought your textbook has some examples. Let me see if, because uh, um, this is kind of a number sense thing, and uh, it's good to have some sense of how large. Let me see if I search for Tesla, it'll show up. Mm, okay, somewhere around here. Click for the Tesla. And I was hoping there might be a table of stuff. Um, maybe not. Um, so I can give you some values and I will give you ideas for Google search. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the most uh, commonly uh, known value of magnetic field that you can compare to is geomagnetic field, the magnetic field from Earth. That, that's how compasses work. So that's uh, around uh, the size of, I have this number memorized in Gauss um, rather than Tesla. <laughs> so in Gauss, it, this is about one Gauss. Um, and uh, um, let's see, one Gauss unit of magnetic field is 10 to the minus four Tesla. It's a little bit uh, awkward because it's not, you know, uh, multiple of three up here. <laughs> so this one gas would be about 10 to the minus four Tesla. Um, I, I think uh, in the lab, it's more like a 0 0.3 gas. Um, so, so that's kind of a starting place. And um, on the larger side, the kind of magnetic field you produce in lab, um, if you have a superconducting magnet, the kind of a large uh, lab, produced a magnetic field is on the order of about one Tesla or the larger end uh, of superconducting magnets would be something like a 10 Tesla. I think you can get one Tesla with regular stuff. You can put through enough loops of wire and enough current to, to get one Tesla that's, um, that doesn't necessarily require superconducting material. 10 Tesla, uh, um, unless you have uh, superconducting wires, so superconducting electromagnet, the amount of current it would require would be so large that um, the regular kind of resistance dissipation losses that'll heat up the magnet pretty quickly. And I think uh, the largest uh, um, uh, kind of constant to current magnetic field that's been produced on a kind of, uh, you know, stable basis, not a sharp, sharp pulse, is around 100, 100 Tesla. So that's the kind of a range. Now, there are, um, there are other naturally occurring magnetic fields that are much larger in, like, astronomical phenomena. So the kind of the Google term that I would encourage you to try out is something like, uh, oh, what is that? <laughs> Typical... Um, Typical magnetic field. Uh, I think that will give, ah, yeah. There's a nice Wikipedia page that gives the different orders of magnitude of magnetic fields. Again, it's a kind of a number sense kind of deal uh, to get a sense of, hey, what's small, what's large. Uh, on the small end is um, kind of what are the, what kind of um, uh, sensitivity do some of the most uh, uh, sensitive magnetometers have? It's done in this range. I think a femto Tesla is about um, small range. And on the larger end, so one Tesla, that's, uh, you know, a lot of practical things have about one Tesla. And around the 10 Tesla is, that's where um, it's like research kind of magnet. And yeah, 100 Tesla. Oh, it's a pulsed. I thought it was continuous. So this is the strongest continuous. And 100 Tesla, oh, I didn't realize that was pulsed, um, non-destructive. So this must be somehow destructive. It involves some kind of explosion. Um, and uh, now at the largest of largest scale, you have things like a magnet star. That's a neutron star, as you can say. <laughs> um, so, so that's the whole range. And uh, I guess if you are ever dealing with 
uh, some engineering application where you're dealing with the magnetic fields, it's good to have some kind of number sense. So that when someone tells you they have a Tesla magnet, you know whether to be impressed or whether to be not impressed. Uh, I guess it depends on context. In our lab, we don't really have a Tesla magnet. Um, the setup you are using for charge to mass ratio has, uh, you've measured it. I think it was around what, 10, millitesla, so point, point 0.1 Tesla or so. Uh, it's kind of typical. Um, useful magnetic field okay let's keep going here um name and describe uh three types of magnetism exhibited my materials yeah let me um yeah so let me give you those three and you can search around either in your textbook or uh, actually your textbook has a whole section on those <laughs> so let me go to the sec so it's you know ferromagnetism paramagnetism diamagnetism your textbook will list all three um, there's a whole section on um, <laughs> magnetism in matter so um, and really this section is the reason we didn't skip dielectric and dielectric materials and made it sure to cover it so that when we get to here you have something to compare it to so um, so paramagnetism diamagnetism and ferromagnetism and uh, yeah it's a nice section I, I think I have the question there just so that you will read through this section and summarize it um, in some form so so yeah I think that's all the questions um,